Good? All right, in Granbury, Texas, we just did a candidate forum, and I just met Wade Brown, who... Hi, Adam. Hey. Who's running for the United States House of Representatives in District 11 against Michael Conaway? I was really, really impressed with him and with his presentation. Wanted to give you guys a chance to get to know him a little bit better. So, uh, Wade Brown, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you mentioned you have military in your background. Yes, I am currently an officer in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. I'm a major, still actively serving in the reserves. Uh, I'm a small business owner, and uh, and I just think our country is uh, is running away from us, and that we need uh, we need to put the right people in, in office at the federal level. Amen. Um, now you're running against Michael Conaway, who is a five-term incumbent in the Midland area, old friend of George W. Bush. Um, what about his record, his service? Do you think could use improving? Well, the primary reason I'm running against Mr. Conaway, there are two of them. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, he has his bottom line end of the results record is one of big spending, and big spending I equate big spending with big government. Uh, so I have characterized him in the past as a big government Republican uh, because of the bills that he has voted for that have put us further and further into debt. To me, that's an unacceptable position, particularly for someone who's going to call themselves a fiscal conservative. Um, and we, we need someone who's going to represent us and basically position us to, to stand on our principles and stand on what we know is right about the future of our country and the future of our children with regard to our national debt and, and our spending habits. Uh, the other reason I'm running against Mr. Conaway is because, in my estimation, uh, and based purely on the law and the Constitution, we have a president who's become all too willing to exceed the limitations of his office in ways that are purely unconstitutional, and our House has failed. It's failed in its responsibility to check the executive branch. Uh, and so now we're dealing with multiple excesses coming out of that office. Uh, and we need someone who's unafraid to, to call it what it is and basically say, Mr. President, you're in violation of this law. Or you, you know, Attorney General, you violated this, and we're going to hold you accountable. Um, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not going to put up with And that. one of the points you made earlier that, I, that struck with me, because it was a big deal to me at the time, was one thing specifically you mentioned was Obama's unconstitutional war in Libya, correct? That is absolutely 100% a clear-cut, unconstitutional, and unlawful move by the president. It's as plain as it can be in law. You just have to read Title 50 U.S. Code, which is based off the War Powers Act. Uh, and then you have to know the history of that uh, incursion into Libya, which was that he did it completely without consulting Congress, which he must do by law. And we found out about that about two or three weeks after the invasion began and our uh, strikes began, when the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, came out and said, Mr. the President never consulted with us about this. Well, what action then did our House Take. What then action did our legislature take? None. And so, as a result, you have Benghazi, and then you, you had all the complications associated with that, and you, and you still have this reticence by people who are in the position and have the role and responsibility of standing up for the, our constitutional form of government against this president who have failed to do so. Yes, I know one thing personally for me that I, I like is... People talk about Benghazi a fair amount, but don't talk about how we got into Libya in the first place. So I personally really appreciated that. Now, one other thing that well, you... Well, let me interrupt you, because one of the th things that's important about the invasion of Libya is the way the Obama the argument the Obama administration used is that it was a UN-led uh, invasion, and therefore it wasn't really a U.S., it didn't right. fall under the War Powers Act. Well, all you have to do is go read about the... the actual um, operation, it was led by the United States Africa Command commander, a general-led uh, intervention, and we did have active, uh, not just Tomahawk missiles, we had air overflight, we had people over the nation of Libya attacking it without a declaration of war uh, and without any sort of authorization from the Congress, C completely and purely unconstitutional. Amen. Um, now, one other thing that you mentioned earlier that I wanted to get is you have a very specific plan that, you know, to force the Democrats to come to the table, force Harry Reid, force Obama to the table, that frankly a lot of Republicans in D.C. have been pretty reticent to go down. So do you want to just walk through what you think, what sure. you would personally sure. do to bring Harry Reid and Obama to yes. the table? Yes, and it's based on law. It does not require an amendment. Title 31 U.S. Code, Section 1055, says the President must, by the first Monday of February every year, bring a, a shall, it says, the, the terminology is shall, shall present to the Congress 
a budget. And not only does he have to present the next year's budget, but he has to present four additional budgets projected into the future. So, of course, Mr. Obama has failed uh, to provide the budget which was due to the Congress last week. So he is he is he is not in compliance with the law, Title again, Title 31 U.S. Code. <clears throat> the House, which is in charge of appropriations according to the Constitution, simply must uh, go back to the president and say, Mr. President, we need a balanced budget plan. We give you four years to do it. You know, uh, ideally, it's, under, it's within his current term of office, but I'm willing to offer, and I think the House ought to be willing to offer four years to the president to balance, to give us a balanced budget plan, balances the budget during four years. Um, and I have basically you know, pledged that if the president does that, I will vote in support of his budget. But he's got to show us how it balances. We've got to have a plan. Now, if he fails to do that, then in the House what we have to do is write an appropriations bill that balances the budget in four years and, and puts it into law and basically is an across-the-board uh, proportional cut for every uh, budget line item in the, in the government, in the U.S. government. And the reason it's important that it be proportional and not have any exceptions to that is so that you can make that pitch on a bipartisan or a multipartisan uh, fat, uh, footing, where basically it's going to affect everyone the same. It'll affect all Americans the same. It'll affect all offices the same. This is, but we've got to get to a balanced budget. So Congress, if the Democrats don't come to the table on that, then, then you have to go to the next step, which is, okay, well, then we're going to offer a bill that funds the essential uh, services that the government provides, uh, like air traffic control, border security, the Department of Defense, as well as, uh, and also we also need to put on the table funding for our loan obligations so that we, we can't have this, we can't allow this argument that says we're going to go into default as a, as a right. country. You've got to take that off the table. Okay, great. Here's a bill that funds that, funds essential services. Democrats, you know, opposing parties, non-conservatives, are you willing to support this bill? And if they don't support that bill, and of course the whole time we're doing this, you're always pointing back to the office that rightfully has the responsibility for the budget, which is the president. Uh, but if the Congress fails to pass that due to opposition in the House, then then we simply we simply turn off the federal government until such time, be because of the because of the the consequences of continuing to spend are so disastrous. We've got to force our president to be responsible for the res responsibilities associated with his office. And in the event we were to get to the end of that sort of situation, you would be willing to leave that part of the federal government shut down indefinitely. Yes, and, and, and anytime anybody talk to the any any member of the House talk to the press, where in our law it starts, like I said, with Title Thirty One U.S. Code, the president shall present a budget. The president, the only thing I'm attempting to hold the president accountable for with regard to the budget is that he balances it within his current term. I think that's reasonable, uh, and I think when you've got the, for a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs who, while he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said that our national debt is our greatest national security threat. This is an issue of national security. It's an, it's an issue of fiscal security. And it has global impacts. When, when a, If America gets to a position where we suffer economic catastrophe, it will have around-the-globe impacts and will <coughs> impact us for generations into the future. The stakes are that high, and so we've got to hold the line. All right. Um, if there's anything else that you would like to get out about your campaign, about who you are personally to a wider audience, what would it be? Uh, it would be that we as a people have got to, we've got to communicate more um, and we've got to know more about what's going on in our government. Um, with regard to my particular candidacy, I have, I have pledged to avoid corruption in a number of ways. Uh, I've pledged to not accept the congressional salary, uh, to not participate in the congressional retirement system. It's not because I'm independently wealthy, uh, it's, but I have served in the Marine Corps, and so I've thought, what's fair to myself, what's fair to my family, and what's fair based on the experience I have? A paycheck that is equivalent of my officer's salary. So I will only accept the salary and benefits that would have been paid to me had I remained on active duty. Uh, which is about half that of a congressman. Now that's that is symbolic in some ways, but it is also uh, very intentionally a, a a way for me to show to people that I believe that if you're going to call yourself a representative, you should be representing the people who are your constituents. And so, if I'm going to ask for government cuts in spending. The first cut should come from my own salary, and I'm going to challenge my fellow congressmen. I'm probably not going to be very popular up there at the beginning because I'm going to challenge every other member of Congress to do the same thing. Voluntarily cut your own salary so that the people of our, the people of our country can shake off some of the cynicism that has settled in on us. 
and basically and reawaken people to the hey these are public servants you know and that's what I'm willing to do and I'm willing to challenge other people in office to follow my example in that and if folks wanted to learn more about your campaign or donate to your campaign what's the campaign website wadebrownforcongress.com and it's spelled out wadebrownforcongress.com Wade Brown and there's a donation link there and everything else all right wade brown best of luck to you thanks Adam. thanks 10 minutes and 30 seconds my